What's up guys, Coach Jeremy here. I uh, just moved into a new spot, which explains why I haven't been posting videos in the last few weeks. I've been busy getting moved in, but I'm here planning on pumping out a ton of hockey videos. And this is the first one, the one I'm most excited about getting up. And that's talking about hockey in Asia. That's because on January 28th, 2017, I hopped on a flight, I flew to Hong Kong, and from there, visited four different countries in Asia and ran hockey camps in every single one. So in this video, I just wanted to show you guys what hockey is like in these countries, what the culture is like in a place where they don't have outdoor ice. In fact, they, they barely have indoor ice. Some of the countries only have two or three hockey rinks, but there's still a small, thriving hockey community. So I wanted to show you the similarities and the differences. Uh, and at the end of the video, I wanna talk about hockey in China, because that's a whole other beast. And there's something crazy going on leading up to the Olympics. So we'll talk about that at the end of the video. But for now, let's take a look at the trip. The trip started with about 20 hours of straight travel. And that's with a 12 hour time difference. That means when it's midnight back home, it's lunchtime in Hong Kong. So I landed in Hong Kong at 7 p.m. off a direct flight. And I figured that I was gonna head to a hotel, get refreshed, relax for the next day. Just got off the flight in Hong Kong and I've already found myself at a roller rink in the outskirts of Hong Kong. And apparently I'm playing next. Mid game, the guy said, lace them up, let's go. So I got rented roller skates, I, got, I borrowed a hockey stick, I borrowed some gear, and before you know it, 20 hours of straight travel and I'm thrown into a roller hockey game. Of course, I can't say no to hockey, so I had a blast, scored a couple goals. Actually, no, I'm just gonna cut to the uh, Instagram story footage. Take a look. So I'm officially a member of the Bloody Oranges. <laughs> All right, let's go Hong Kong Bloody Oranges. Hi. All right, boys, what's the game plan? Hi, hello. Score. Score more. Hey. <laughs> what's the plan? Score more than the other team. They know hockey. Good news is we're up by two. Bad news is I don't know how to stop on roller blades. It's early in the last period. We're up by two, and I'm going for my first career hat trick in the International Hong Kong Hockey League. Wish me luck. Got the hattie, but now the real important part, can I make this shot? No. So that's how I kicked off the trip. Of course, I went out after with the guys to get to know everybody. That's where I met Coach Theo. One thing I was worried about is, do the kids know how to speak English? Do the coaches know how to speak English? How am I gonna demonstrate these drills? So I met Coach Theo there, and luckily, he spoke English, so that was one more worry off my plate. We went out, hit the hotel then, and the next day flew off to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and that's where I ran the very first hockey camp. In Malaysia, I was met with a hero's welcome. The people were amazing, the culture was amazing, the food, I was so surprised, because to be honest, I hadn't really heard of Kuala Lumpur, but it was a great place to visit. What I was really interested in was getting to the rink and figuring out what the hockey culture was like. So when I looked up where I was gonna teach, at first it was a hockey rink inside of a pyramid. So I thought that was gonna be pretty crazy, but it turns out they had just built an Olympic sized ice rink in Malaysia and that's where we got moved to. The facility was amazing. In fact, they had just hosted a couple international hockey events there. Uh, the ice conditions on the other hand, it's practically raining in here. This is built inside of a mall, but the mall isn't open yet, but it's still pretty popular. This is uh, public skating going on right now. You can see there's a lot of water on the ice, so not perfect, but I mean, it's a rink in Malaysia, so can't complain. Not perfect, there was some humidity in the air, uh, the water on the ice, but I don't think they had it fully operational for hockey because they pretty much just keep it open for public skating. They wanna save money, it's expensive to keep that ice perfect. Uh, but overall, still great experience. <laughs> Very famous. It's, uh, Canada too. No, you're, spo Canada. you're supposed to drop them before you go. Oh. Here, I'll, sh I'll show you. Like this. Boxing, boxing. Yeah. So you gotta go like this, and if you wanna fight, like that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now what really blew me away in Malaysia was the hockey culture. I didn't know what to expect. An Asian country, not a big population, uh, ice rink that used to be inside a pyramid. So I didn't know how committed people actually were, but it was pretty much like walking through a hockey rink in small town Canada. I grew up in a town of about a thousand people and everyone loved hockey. Now, in Kuala Lumpur, not everyone loves hockey, but the people who play there, they really love hockey, you can tell. Officially my first time coaching in Malaysia. You guys love hockey? Yeah! <laughs> all the kids want to do is play hockey, so they're all spread around the outside of the rink before they go on the ice, and they're playing hockey with pop cans and bottle caps and just creating their own games. 
You talk to the parents and they're talking about, oh, how much it costs to travel and how they don't go on vacations anymore because all they do is travel with their kids and play hockey. It's just like hockey in Canada. It was really, really surprising. It's once you catch the bug for hockey, once you have that love, it's the same whether you're in a small town in Ontario or whether you're in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So I was really blown away by that. I thought it was really cool. So the next thing you're probably wondering is, yeah, the hockey culture is cool, but I bet they're pretty bad because that's what you think. You think, oh, you're, you're in Asia, you're not gonna be a good hockey player. Here's the thing though. If you get time on the ice, it doesn't matter where you're born. If you spend that time practicing, you can become pretty good. I could guarantee you some of these kids, they could go from Malaysia and they could fly to Toronto and make a AAA hockey team. I would put money on it because they're on the ice three or four times a week. They've got some pretty good coaches coming in. So just because you're born in a place where hockey isn't that popular doesn't mean you can't become a good player. I was really impressed with the skills of some of these players. And of course, there were some that were just, you know, learning or not that great. And that's the difference. They just didn't have that depth. In countries like Canada and the States where there's a million kids signed up to play hockey, you can find a lot of really good players. Here, there were a few, and the few that were good were really good. And then you have the middle and then the ones that are just learning. But the thing that they had, they all loved hockey. And that's why I was there, to share my love for the game with other people who love the game and help them get just a little bit better every time they get on the ice. So after a two-day camp in Kuala Lumpur, it was off to Manila, flying to the Philippines for another two-day camp. Fun fact about hockey rinks in Asia. Pretty much all of them are inside of malls, which means it's pretty hard to get the ice conditions perfect. So this was another rink in a mall, but I liked how they had it set up. Let's take a look. A lot of gold. You gotta see things. See new places and brand new things. Gotta go places and do things. Maybe to forget it. in the malls is that they're in the middle of the mall so they want to keep the mall warm and they want to keep the ice frozen so pretty much the only thing keeping the ice frozen is the refrigerant running underneath but the air on top is warm which makes the ice pretty slushy and warm so this rink was at kind of like the back corner of the mall so it was still pretty good but as you can see still a little foggy still a little soft something that i thought was really cool that i haven't seen in north america is freestyle skating this is kind of like a subculture of public skating these are kids who own skates, they go to public skating all the time, and they want to take it up a notch. So I would classify it as like extreme public skating. They're doing moves, they're doing tricks, they form a group, they take Instagram pictures, they have a name for their group, and they want to get better, and as they get better, they move up to the more advanced freestyle skating groups. In my opinion, this is a great way to work on your agility and your balance and your edge work on the ice. And some of the kids moved from freestyle skating to become hockey players. And there was a few of them that came out with the uh, hockey camp that I was running there. I was really impressed with the level of some of the talent, especially with the younger players. This was the sort of place where I could tell hockey had been here for a while, it was happening, but maybe it didn't flourish until recently. And I think that's because it takes a few generations for it to really catch on. You have to improve the coaching and have kids be inspired. And that's what I could tell. I could tell that these young guys had seen the older guys and they wanted to be like them. And that gave them the drive and the motivation to become really great hockey players. So I was impressed with the level of the talent with the young guys. So that brings me to the next point that I want to talk about. And that's how the organization is structured to allow players to develop and grow and to continue to be challenged as they progress through the years playing in a small center like this. But let's head over to the next country first. The next country that we flew to was Thailand and I was really excited to go to Thailand. I heard so many good things about the people, the country, the culture, and I love Thai food. It is my favorite by far. So we went to Bangkok and well, Bangkok is a different city. We'll just leave it at that. But what I really want to talk about is the minor hockey organizations because they don't really have that per se in every one of these countries. But what I did notice is that every single country had the same theme. They had people at the top who really loved and cared about the game. They cared about the people and the players and the parents involved. And that is really what drove these countries to be able to have a successful hockey program. 
in a country where hockey isn't as popular, where you're not having as many people sign up. They only have a few hundred players in the entire country playing. Let me show you the hockey rink here in Thailand. It's inside this massive mall, right over there. Got some kids warming up outside the rink. Nice to meet you, buddy. I was doing a little video. This is where they have public skating, and this is where they play hockey, a small little area. So they can't have the same structure as they have in countries where there's a ton of kids signed up, where it's like tier after tier after tier, you work your way up. In these countries, it kind of reminded me of a uh, well-organized men's league where there's you know, your A division, B division, C division, but it's kind of just like one big group, and everyone kind of moves up within it. They have kids that were playing, a really good 12 year old could also play in the adult league. And the adult league is the feeder system to the national team system. So you're not going from, you know, house league to select to double A AA to triple A and then make your major junior and then from major junior you're on like the, you represent the national team. That's, that's not how it worked. It was basically, if you're a really good 12 year old player, you can play with the men's guys in like the adult league and you know you develop there and once you're 16 you can play on the you know under 18 team and represent the country after a three-day camp in thailand it was off to hong kong to finish up the tour with a two-day camp there and this is where i want to talk about some of the challenges that the hockey families and players are facing and it's pretty much the same challenges that every hockey player faces uh, ice time is expensive equipment is expensive uh, hard to get enough ice time but the problem is it's kind of multiplied for these players because it's even more expensive to keep a rink open, so the ice time is a lot more expensive. The equipment is shipped in. If they want good equipment, it's not as easily accessible as it is in North America. Uh, the expenses, you know, if you want to play in a tournament, you might have to, fl well, pretty much you always have to fly somewhere. And uh, the nice thing is you're flying to Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia, uh, there's nice tropical places, so it is kind of like a vacation. But in Hong Kong, I think that's where it's probably the most expensive to play hockey, and that's because of the ice time. Real estate is at an all-time premium. There's not a lot of space in Hong Kong. So if they're taking up an entire area for a hockey rink, it's got to bring in the big bucks. To rent ice, you're looking at between $1,000 to $2,000 for one hour. One hour of ice time versus about 100 bucks to three, four, 500 bucks, I guess, is the high end in uh, cities around North America. So that's getting pretty pricey. If you want to go to drop in hockey, you want to just go play some pickup, 10 bucks in most places, 100 bucks US in Hong Kong. So let's see where you can play hockey in Hong Kong. We were playing at the Dragon Center. This is a hockey rink that is at the top of a mall. And going above this rink is a roller coaster that is not operational anymore, but you can see kind of like a dragon roller coaster loop going around. Uh, very interesting facility for sure. It does get a bit warm up there. The ice isn't perfect, but you can still play. What I was impressed at though was the use of the ice. This is definitely a place where North America could take some lessons. They are using every square inch of that ice. When it's booked out, it costs a thousand dollars. There are at least five instructors going. They have their own little square that they blocked off and that's where they're training about three or four kids each. So a third of the ice is blocked off for public skating. A third is blocked off for some figure skating and another third is blocked off for hockey lessons. And of that third of the ice, it's blocked off into four or five different sections for training hockey players. And I think that that's a really smart idea. Reduce the cost by allowing multiple instructors to be on the ice all at once and they can be training the, the kids there. That way you can help teach a lot more players. So Hong Kong was the end of the trip, but not the end of this video because I wanna talk about the growth of hockey in Asia and it could be huge. Hockey's been going on for about 10, 15 years in a lot of these countries and it's kind of at that point now where it could use a really big boost and I think that's coming because China on February 4th, 2022 is hosting the Winter Olympics. They're in the process of building 500 hockey rinks. That's quite a bit. They have a population of over a billion people. They want to have 20 million people playing hockey. It's a pretty lofty goal, but I, I mean, if anyone can do it, it's China. Part of the problem with playing hockey is getting on the ice. It's tough if your country only has two or three rinks, like a lot of the countries that I visited. Uh, you just can't play. So building 500 rinks, that is a huge start. Does that catch them up with Canada? No, we've got about, we've got over 3,000 rinks. Now some of them are closing down. That's a story for a different video. Uh, the States has about 1,300. So China wouldn't quite be there, 
but they would have more than Sweden and Finland and those are countries that compete at the international level with Canada. So it's not unrealistic to think that China could be competing. I wouldn't say in the next five years, that's what they want. They want a team in the Olympics that will be able to compete and go up against uh, Canada and the United States. And they're bringing in coaches from some of the best coaches to China to teach their players. So it's gonna be pretty interesting. I'm definitely looking forward to that. And speaking of coaches going to China, yes, I will be going to China as well for two weeks at the end of August, thanks to Go Hockey, who is a Chinese hockey company that's setting up the camp, and TC Sports Group, who is helping organize everything with the travel and all that stuff. I will be there, I'm gonna bring my camera for sure. I wanna show the growth, show the culture, see what's happening there, because it could be a little bit different than some of the other Asian countries. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching this video. And uh, you know, now that I moved into the new place, I will be making a lot more videos. I got a bunch on the backlog that I have to get out for you guys. So stay tuned for a lot more hockey videos coming your way. Thanks for watching this one. We'll see you in the next one. See new places and brand new things. Gotta go places and do things. Baby, do Jeez, when's the last time you washed your feet? Never, never. <laughs> First time in First years. Time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little hurt. Oh, you're so. <laughs>